dia, pessoal. Sejam todos bem-vindos ao CX Summit 2017. Eu que faço parte desde o primeiro, posso dizer para vocês que o conteúdo é bárbaro. E eu acho que assim, ver o evento bombando de gente interessada em gente, no ser humano, além do cliente, enxergar, enxergar além do business, é muito legal. Por isso, uma salva de palmas para vocês. Vamos acordar. É isso aí, gente. Muito bem-vindos. Então, e para começar a nossa experiência aqui, para que ela seja incrível, eu tenho algumas informações para dar para vocês, tá? Primeiro de tudo, é uma coisa assim que eu nunca vi em outro evento também. É o contato direto com a equipe do CX Summit. Eles dão a cara para bater mesmo. Então, pode anotar aí. Vocês podem anotar? Aqui, tá aqui. Os dados deles. Você pode adicionar o Tomás, a Pan e a Verônica no WhatsApp e conversar com eles o tempo inteiro no evento. Tá? Qualquer dúvida, pergunta, ajuda, qualquer coisa. Dizer, tá bárbaro, não tá, não estou gostando. Pode mandar. Eles dão a cara para bater mesmo. É para ter esse contato com eles. Podem anotar, tirem fotos e depois vocês anotem aí no celular de vocês. Sobre a internet, vocês podem se conectar com a rede CX, tá? A senha, mas é para se conectar mesmo. Como é? Ninguém está anotando? Cadê o dedinho? A senha é TSCX 2017. Lembrando que tudo é minúsculo. Vamos se conectar e vamos conversar com todo mundo. Assim ninguém gasta o 4G. É, toaletes. Os toaletes estão localizados no quinto piso. É enorme aqui, né, gente? Eu estou perdidaça. Mas aqui também tem. No quinto piso é atrás das escadas. O acesso é bem fácil e se vocês tiverem algum problema de localização, as concierges que estão com essa roupinha linda dos anos 50, 60 de aeromoça, podem ajudar vocês se vocês se perderem, tá? Elas são o GPS do local. Não sou eu. Aqui não sou eu. E aqui atrás também tem toalete, tá? Uh, Para nossa segurança, nós temos uma equipe de bombeiros também, que está à disposição. E, além disso, a equipe da Mil também está à disposição com um ambulatório médico preparado exclusivamente para o CX Summit 2017. Sobre perguntas e respostas, todos os participantes podem interagir e fazer as perguntas para os palestrantes através do aplicativo CX Summit. Todo mundo já baixou? Se não baixou, se precisa do link, manda um WhatsApp lá para a turma da equipe e aí vocês conseguem baixar esse aplicativo. Na sacola que está na cadeira de vocês, vocês vão encontrar uns botões. Já viram? Caneta não tem, mas botão tem, tá, gente? Né? Caneta não tem. Esses botões servem como moeda de troca para as estações gourmet de café premium e brigadeiro. A ideia desses botões é a seguinte, gente. Cada botão da Track Sale pode ser trocada, trocado por um café. E cada botão da 99 Pop pode ser trocado por um brigadeiro. E o objetivo, gente, é claro, não é ficar comendo brigadeiro e tomando café. É trocar, é compartilhar, é fazer o network. Então, não adianta assim ter um monte de botão ou trocar. Aí, o interessante é realmente fazer essa interação e trocar. Quem quer o brigadeiro, quem quer o café e troca. Porque eu acho que alguns só tem botões da, da, da Track Sale e outros só da 99 Pop. Então é isso aí. O que vale é o network, ok? Almoço. A nossa próxima parada será na hora do almoço, só. A gente vai sair um pouquinho mais cedo, às 11h40. Para mim está ótimo, porque eu acordei às 5 da manhã. Tá? Então está tá excelente. Também porque a praça de alimentação, gente, assim... Uma muvuca tremenda. Então, a gente tem que sair cedo para poder ter espaço para comer. Tem vários restaurantes na praça de alimentação que fica no quarto piso. Qualquer coisa, as meninas estão aí para ajudar. Mas, se vocês quiserem, tem outras opções também de restaurantes no shopping inteiro. Importante, importantíssimo, lembrar de voltar às 13h50 em ponto para a gente retornar com as nossas atividades. Coffee break. De tarde a gente vai ter um welcome coffee, uma dinâmica bem legal. E o coffee terá 40 minutos. E esse momento, lógico, é para network. 
que é mais importante do que o café, né? Nada como um cafezinho, um coffee break e um papo legal, né? Palestra final. A palestra de encerramento vai ser única, tá? Então, todos vão ter que ir para o palco ex Experts, que é no sexto andar. Sexto, lá embaixo, né? Quinto. É, então é o quinto. Aqui está... É. Todos que estão aqui, que é o Experts, o sexto andar, vão ter que ir para o quinto andar. Tá? Viu como eu sou perdida? Não se preocupem, que a gente tem as meninas aqui, eu vou atrás delas. Elas vão guiando a gente. E o encerramento do evento vai ser às 19 horas. Vale a pena ficar até o último minuto. O conteúdo é muito bom, por isso que está bombando, gente. Bom, certificado. Todos que estão aqui hoje receberão um certificado de participação. Fica de olho no seu e-mail, que eu acho que o certificado deve ir por e-mail. Acho que ele não vai ser entregue aqui agora, tá? Então é isso. Vê na caixa de spam, entre em contato, manda o WhatsApp para o Thomas, para a Verônica. E é isso. E as palestras online, a gente vai gravar, tudo vai ser gravado aqui no CX Summit e a gente vai disponibilizar todas que tiverem autorização do palestrante, lógico. Temos também as entrevistas digitais que serão enviadas para todos os participantes. E agora, para abrir e falar um pouquinho mais do evento, eu chamo o Arthur Meyer da Track Sale. Arthur, vem. Bom dia, tudo bom com vocês? Vocês estão gostando por enquanto? Está começando agora. Tá? O CIX Summit ele foi preparado, já tem uns muitos meses que a gente está preparando esse evento para vocês. Tá? Por enquanto, tudo que eu vi está incrível, então eu espero que esse dia vai ser muito especial para todo mundo. Tá? É uma apresentação muito rápida, o meu nome é Arthur, eu sou o Head de Sucesso do Cliente na Track Sale. E não só eu, mas como a equipe toda da Trexail, estamos à disposição. Tá? Pode contar com a gente, para o que precisar, qualquer dúvida, qualquer observação que vocês tenham, é com a gente que você pode conversar. Ótimo. Queria desejar as boas-vindas para todos vocês. Muito obrigado pela presença. Tá? É muito especial, é muito gratificante ver todos vocês aqui. Inclusive o palco VIP lotado. Isso para a gente é muito importante. Tá? O CX Summit ele é um evento de experiência do cliente, como vocês sabem. A gente pretende entregar uma experiência encantadora para todos. Bom, o que, que acontece? O CX Summit ele tem alguns números que são muito interessantes. Tá? Alguns números que eu gostaria de trazer para vocês. Vocês já devem saber que o evento foi sold out. Não enchemos todas as cadeiras, todos os lugares estão cheios. Tivemos uma lista de espera e são 800 pessoas aqui hoje que você pode conversar, que você pode fazer um networking e trocar experiências. Temos muitas pessoas muito, extremamente qualificadas, tá bom? São, vou, vou trazer alguns números, tá? Estou colando mesmo. São 36 é, participantes nível é, de Chief Office. Né? São C-Levels aqui presentes com a gente. Né, são pessoas de grande influência, principalmente nesse meio de experiência do cliente. Vale a pena procurar elas, trocar ideia com todo mundo. Nós temos 54 pessoas que levam o nome Customer no seu cargo. Né, eles trabalham com o cliente. Eu sou um deles. Eu sou Customer Success. Com certeza que tem vários outros. Né. A gente, além disso, temos também... 74 diretores. Além dos C-Levels, a gente ainda tem 74 diretores. Então, vocês veem que é, a gente está trazendo pessoas com uma, uma experiência muito grande, pessoas com um poder dentro da organização muito grande para estimular a experiência do cliente, para fazer isso crescer, principalmente no nosso país, que ainda é um pouco debilitado nisso. A gente tem, além disso, 184 pessoas que, com cargo de gerente. Tá, são pessoas também que estão, às vezes, lidando diretamente com o cliente, pessoas que organizam toda a estrutura das empresas. Tá? Bom, hoje é dia 28, né? e eu queria dizer que temos um aniversariante, pelo menos que a gente saiba. Se vocês também forem aniversariantes, se manifestem, porque é, vai ter um brindezinho especial, mas é, não posso contar qual que é. Bom, é, se tiver aniversário na semana, também está valendo. É tipo o boate. Desde que você faça aniversário, é só avisar para a gente que está ótimo. Bom, é, é com muito orgulho que eu posso dizer que nós temos 121 
clientes da Track Sale aqui presente. Né? Eu, eu sei que tem alguns aqui, é, eu já conversei com vários que estão lá embaixo também. É, Para mim é um motivo especial, porque são pessoas que eu converso quase todos os dias. E é muito bom ver que não só eles estão preocupados em monitorar o NPS, mas que eles estão preocupados em fazer algo que eu sou apaixonado, que é melhorar a experiência do cliente. Bom, é, são 12 estados brasileiros. Tá? Nós temos pessoas aí de diversas partes do Brasil. São Paulo é um motivo, é, foi escolhido como sede do nosso evento por ser um local que concentra muitas pessoas. E não só isso, a gente tem também o orgulho de falar que nós temos três outros países, além do Brasil, participando do nosso evento. Então, são pessoas que vieram de fora para vir aqui prestigiar e aprender um pouquinho com a gente. É, a gente fez um estudo, são mais de 500 empresas aqui com a gente hoje. Tá? Então, é, muitas pessoas de muitas empresas. Se a gente somar o faturamento dessas 500 empresas que estão aqui, que são empresas de peso, a gente vai ter aproximadamente 40% do PIB brasileiro. Então, assim tema experiência do cliente é um tema importante, está crescendo e vocês estão saindo na frente de estar tá aqui nesse evento hoje. Né? São 800 pessoas que vão levar este conhecimento para dentro das suas empresas, que vão levar este conhecimento que vai transformar a experiência de consumo no Brasil. Bom, perfeito. Era isso que eu tinha para falar para vocês. Tá bom? Novamente, sejam muito bem-vindos. E eu gostaria agora de chamar para o palco Alguém que, assim, eu fiquei muito honrado quando me convidaram para abrir para ele, que é o Lincoln, o Lincoln Murphy. Ele é o grande nome de Customer Success hoje. Ele já trabalhou com consultoria em centenas de empresas no exterior e várias delas aqui no Brasil, com foco total em sucesso do cliente. Tá? O Lincoln é americano, é, então eu vou chamar ele em inglês para subir, tá bom? Well, Lincoln, please... Come forward, say hi to everyone. Bom dia. Ah, hey. Bom dia. Okay. So this is going to be in English. I will try to uh, both go fast enough to give you everything that you need uh, out of this and slow enough that you can actually understand me. And I think this is where my slides are, so I'll try to stay out of the way without getting the feedback. Or maybe not. We'll make it work. All right. So, why am I here? I, I'm a customer success guy. Why am I here at a customer experience summit? Well, actually, I actually think it's pretty cool that I was invited to be here because I think customer experience without customer success is kind of pointless. If we have a customer experience that doesn't lead to success, who cares? What's the experience about, right? So we need to make sure that we keep the customer's success in mind. I'm getting a ton of feedback up here. Is it just me? If it is, I'll keep going. Cool. All right. So what we're going to talk about is how to acquire the best customers, make them successful, and eliminate churn forever. This would be an inappropriate experience. <laughs> This is me. Um, I make myself pretty available. There's my email address. Uh, if you're on Twitter, you can follow me at Lincoln Murphy. Um, if you have nice things to say, if you, if you take pictures and want to tag me, uh, cool. If you have nice things to say, please tag me. If you have negative things to say about me, Please don't tag me. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to see it. Uh, so if you have questions about what I talk about, feel free to reach out. Okay. So we're going to talk about this. This sort of a little bit of history with customers, and, and I think this slide of a tug of war really kind of describes the the way that we work with customers. In the, uh, certainly in the past, there was there was definitely a power struggle, and I think a little bit that exists more in Brazil from what I've seen. Uh, than it does in the US. There's still sort of a cycle of distrust between the customers and the vendors. And I think the vendors are the only ones that are in a position to really make that change. In the US, it's, it's certainly there, uh, but it's something that I was told about when I, when I came here for the first time, and it's something that I've seen. 
And so the vendors really have to work to break this, this cycle of distrust, to break this power struggle. And so I say that it's been sort of a power shift, right? And this is a, this is a bigger issue uh, than, than, than just a cycle of distrust. We know that, that customers have a lot of power, right? Customers, well, we don't lock them into contracts as much anymore. They have the ability to share their experience online. Um, that's, that's, they, they have a lot more power. So we would say that the power has shifted to the customer. But the reality is we share the power. And if you understand that, then you're gonna make a lot more progress than if you think that, oh my gosh, all the power has just shifted to the customer and, and we, we're now at their mercy. No, this is, this is, it takes two uh, to, be, to make this thing work. In a relationship, I saw this defined once and I thought it was amazing. In a relationship, power is the capacity to alter the state of others. Think about that. Power is the capacity to alter the state of others. Now, at least, in the, again, in the relationship. Well, if we think about that, you exist as a company, as a vendor, in the relationship with your customer. You exist to alter their state. That's actually really cool. It, but it, it kind of gives you an understanding of where you fit into their world. And in fact, your value prop, the thing that you sell, your pitch, probably has to do with, I don't know, altering their state. If you buy my product, you'll be a better version of yourself, right? That's what we sell, almost, in, almost exclusively in some way. Well, don't just sell it, actually understand that that's what you're there to do. You are there to alter the state of your customers. The thing is, that power, it can't just be taken, right? I can't just take that power from you. That power has to be given. It's given to me by the customer. And that power is given to me only once trust has been established. Now, in the sales process, in the marketing process, I'm telling you things that are gonna get you to trust me at least enough, at least enough, to make that initial purchase or to take that first step with me. Now, I have to back up what I said, right? So I make a promise, you trust me, I do what I said I would do, you trust me a little more, and that's how we build a relationship, okay? So trust is required. Kind of like the golden rule, right? This kind of universal, if, if, you, if you do good things for other people, they will do good things for you. What goes around comes around that kind of stuff. That applies in business just as much as it applies in everything else. If you make your customers powerful, this is what I really want you to think about. If you make your customer powerful, they will make you powerful. Now, I don't know if you can see this slide, but I think it's really funny, and I had to figure out a way to include it. So you make your customers powerful, they will make you powerful, you'll be able to pick up giant balls. But let's reflect on this power for a second. How will your customers make you powerful? Let's start there because let's be a little selfish. We're here to learn how to be better at what we do, right? To build better businesses, okay? So how are our customers gonna make us powerful? Well, they will make us powerful by doing these three things. And if you've ever seen me speak before, you know that I boil all of this down to these three things. You want your customers to stay longer, so if they have a subscription with you, they're simply going to continue to renew. If, they buy, if you have a transactional business, it just means that they're gonna to continue to be your customer. They're gonna to continue to buy from you over and over. We also want our customers to buy more. So it's not just that they're gonna stay longer, it's that while they stay longer, they're going to expand their relationship with us. They're going to buy more over that time. That's awesome. And of course, we want our customers to advocate for us, to spread the good word, to go out and tell their friends or their peers or their colleagues about us. If we got all of those things, that would be pretty awesome, right? Okay, that's, if, if we make our customers powerful, they're gonna make us powerful and that's how they're going to do that. And this has great effects on everything from, oh, I don't know, profitability to the value of your company. So it's pretty important stuff. But let's talk about how you make your customers powerful. So we know what we're gonna get out of it. What do they get out of it? How do we actually do this? What does it mean? Well, 
We make them powerful by making them successful. Well, see, here's a problem. What does success mean? You know, is it we give them a good ROI, return on their investment? We give them what? What do we do? So I had to come up with a definition of what success means, at least in this context. And success means, at least in this, in this context, customer success is, and I want you guys to really understand this because it's, it's, it's the baseline for everything we're going to talk about today. Customer success is when our customers achieve their desired outcome through their interactions with our company. And there's a couple of things in here that we want to unpack, we want to talk about. Uh, desired outcome is going to be something we're going to focus heavily on today because it's, it's the key to any customer experience that you might be designing. And of course, interactions is the other piece in here that's, that's important. And all I'll say about that, we'll talk about it a little bit more, but just note that I didn't say, I didn't say this is through the use of our product. That customer success is when our customers achieve their desired outcome through the consumption of our service. I didn't say that, and that's on purpose. It's through their interactions with our company. And those interactions are everything. Are all of the different touch points that they have with us across their entire life cycle. Now the product use or the consumption of our service, that might be the main thing, but it's not the only thing, and we need to understand that. If we sort of keep that definition in mind, and that's how we go about our, our business, I would consider that to be sort of your operating philosophy. Like, this is just, this is how we do business. This is what we're thinking about all the time. Every decision we make is based around this idea of, hey, you know, are we doing what's right to get our customers to achieve their desired outcome through their interactions with us? That's your operating philosophy. But we want to take it a step further. We want to make it our operating model, okay, or even our, our engine, what I call our engine of growth. I refer to customer success as an engine of growth. I actually call it customer success-driven growth. I do that not just to differentiate between the way that I talk about customer success and the way that others might, though I do a little bit. I really do it because that is truly what customer success is. If you do it right, it's going to give you those three things that we all said we want, right? That we all know that we want from, from our relationship with our customers is to get them to stay longer, buy more, and advocate for us. This is what I want you guys to understand about customer success-driven growth. As our customers succeed and evolve, right? Remember, we're selling them on ultimately a better version of themselves. So it, it's kind of odd when I hear from companies, you know, a customer's been with us a year and then they leave. They churn out. They stop being our customer. I don't get it. Nothing changed. It's like, yeah, man, nothing changed with you. Your customer changed, they evolved, they grew. You told them that was what was gonna happen. You actually delivered on it, but you didn't know what to do next. You didn't grow and evolve with them. So keep that in mind. As our customers succeed and evolve, their relationship with us should grow and evolve as well. And that's customer success driven growth. We get our customers on the right track. We understand where they're going and we're able to get them to buy more not because we're trying to force product or services on them at the, you know, to, to meet some sort of internal quota or some sort of internal goal, but because this is the most logical next step for them is to buy this add-on or to get this other service from us. That's awesome. And that's what we need to be thinking about. And that, by the way, is what's going to allow you to exponentially grow your company and not just incrementally grow your company. Internal quotas and goals, you might say, what if I said to you, what if you grew your accounts by 25% this year? I bet some of you would be like, yeah, man, that's awesome. 25%? Let's do it. What if I said, I have some companies that I work with that 10x or 40x their account size, not because they have some sort of internal goal or quota, but because they really understand what that growth, what that evolution with their customers looks like, and they let it play out. They, they make sure it plays out but they don't put artificial limits on their growth. They actually understand the customers and understand that evolution. That's awesome, and that is customer success-driven growth. But let's dig into what this stuff really means. So let's talk about desired outcome, that desired outcome part of the definition. Really, one of the most, one of the most critical things you can understand about customer success, 
forget about customer success. Forget about any sort of definitions. Don't worry about that stuff. You know, if you don't do customer success, you think, well, ha, this stuff doesn't apply. It absolutely applies. So don't get caught up in the customer success part of this. Let's just talk about desired outcome. Desired outcome is one of these absolutely critical things that is so easy from a conceptual standpoint. Don't overthink this. The concept is very simple. Once you understand it though, it's a game changer. It will change everything you do. So don't overthink the concept. Desired outcome is very simple. It's a required outcome plus appropriate experience. Required outcome is what your customer needs to achieve. That's their goal. An appropriate experience is how they need to achieve it. Somebody asked me the other day, well, where does customer experience fit into customer success? And I already, I already sort of told you what I thought at the beginning, but I would say if we were gonna, if, just, to, just to simplify it, replace customer experience with appropriate experience and you're good to go. Desired outcome is so critical because I, if I just give you your required outcome, if I just focus on the thing that you need to achieve, maybe I focus on the functional outcome of your use of my product. I'm only giving you half. I'm not giving you everything that you need. But a lot of companies focus only on the required outcome. And then they say, I don't understand. Why did my customer leave? They were getting everything they needed. Well, they weren't. They were, maybe they were reaching their goal, but they were not actually getting everything they needed. They weren't getting it in the appropriate way. And I'll show you some, uh, some examples in a second. The desired outcome, just to go a little bit deeper on this for you guys, because I want to make sure you walk away with some really tangible uh, things here. We have, like a, we have our customer segment. So, first of all, if you're segmenting your customers based on what they pay you, you're doing it wrong. So I don't care how, you know, if that's, in, if that's from a sales standpoint, if that's account management, if you're doing actual customer success, great. But if you're segmenting your customers based on what they pay you, you're doing it wrong because what you're not taking into consideration is that appropriate experience. So let's say all of our customers all share the same required outcome, which is very possible. Well, different segments of customers, different groups of customers are going to share some particular characteristics. And those characteristics are what's going to define their appropriate experience. If I treat all of my customers the same, then I'm gonna definitely give some of my customers an inappropriate experience. In fact, somebody said the other day, hey, you know, we have, this, we have a mandate in, in, in our company to treat all of our customers the same. And I said, okay, cool. Treat all of your customers the same. Treat them well, treat them with respect. Treat them like they are the human beings that they are even if they work in a giant company. Do the right thing, treat them the same, but give them an appropriate experience. See, I can treat you nice, I can treat you like a human, but then I'm gonna give you the appropriate experience. And I think that's the way we need to look at that. So let's, let's kind of talk about an example here. Uh, just inbound marketing as an example. First of all, if I need more quality leads, let's say, I have lots of different ways that I can, I can achieve that goal. I've chosen inbound marketing for whatever reason. Okay, that's the method that I've chosen. So. In this case, my required outcome is that I get more quality leads. I've chosen inbound marketing. But let's say I'm an early stage startup. Based on the characteristics of an early stage startup, you know, they're, they're more DIY, they, you know, do it yourself mentality. They don't have a lot of money, or at least that's what they say. And they're most probably tech, tech first. You know, they're, they're okay with sort of dropping down to the tech, technology layer and doing stuff that maybe other companies wouldn't be so okay with. Well then, what that means is that the appropriate experience for that customer segment might be an API only, like they, we don't need any sort of graphical interface. Everything is self-service. Maybe they just need a Slack channel for support and you're good to go. But let's say that same required outcome of more quality leads 
and the method they've chosen is inbound marketing, but let's say the customer segment is Fortune 500 uh, department within a Fortune 500 company. Well, in that case, the characteristics are that you know they need this thing to just work, they have money, they're probably not so tech forward, you know, especially if this is a department of business users, right? So they need a graphical interface, they need 24 seven support maybe, Maybe they need to be able to buy this on a three-year contract in a high-touch setting. But we all share, all these customers share the same required outcome. What if you tried to give both of those types of customers the same experience? Probably is not gonna work so well. Can you imagine trying to sell an API and a Slack channel to a Fortune 500 department? Probably not gonna work so well. And on the flip side, even if you were able to get a startup to buy your, your product in a high-touch setting, you're probably, over, it's probably, you're probably overdoing it. You're giving them way more than they need because they actually would be okay with self-service, but you're giving them high touch. And that's, that's often what, really what I see is that we over-deliver for our customers. We'll talk more about that in a second. You guys will not be able to see that, so we'll just move on. Raise your hands if you've ever used a product or consumed a service where you got what you needed to get out of the relationship with that vendor, with that product. You, got your, you achieved your goal, but something wasn't right. Something was missing. So you went out and you found another company to work with that not only gave you your goal, but gave it to you in an in, appropriate way, in the right way, something that felt right. Raise your hand if you've ever experienced that. Raise your hands high so everybody can see it. Awesome, so probably most of you, and, and, and if I gave you a little bit more time, probably all of you could think of an example where we've, we've done that. Then you've experienced appropriate experience, or you've experienced the, the lack thereof, right? How many of your customers today can say the same thing about you, right? How many of your customers can say, you know, I'm getting from this relationship what I need, but something is missing? And see, here's the thing, that something that's missing that, that's quantifiable. You know, I will often use the term feel. Like I, I don't feel like it was a great experience. My customer didn't feel like it was right for them. And some people who are very data-driven get scared about terms like feel. But the reality is, it's all quantifiable. If I asked you to sit down, tell me, you know, come up with that example that you, that you raised your hand about, you could probably list out the reasons it was, you didn't feel like it was successful. So, it's not like this is completely made up, it's not like it's completely just floating around. We know there are very specific things that we can check the boxes on and say, this is why I didn't feel successful. So your customers can do that too. We wanna make sure that they're checking the boxes in the right way. So, moving forward, I said we wanna turn this whole thing, this, this operating philosophy into an operating model. And we want to take that desired outcome and we want to actually make sure that our customers are getting there. Well, that's where this thing called customer success management comes in. And customer success management, this is my definition for it, it's the process of moving the customer toward their ever-evolving desired outcome. Now, I want you to, to note what's missing from this definition. It says nothing about technology. It says nothing about any particular business model. It says nothing about people. In other words, I don't care how you implement this concept, just implement it. It's the process of moving our customers toward their ever-evolving desired outcome. The thing that I really want you to pay attention to is that ever-evolving piece. We've already sort of talked about that a little bit, right? Our customers are always changing, always evolving, always growing. So once a customer achieves their initial desired outcome, that initial required outcome certainly, then what's the next thing? And how can we move them along? So customer success management can be something where you have a team of people actively working with your customers in a, in a proactive way to move them towards their ever evolving desired outcome. It can be technology that simply interacts with the customer at various points, email or whatever, it, or it can be built into your product so that your product is actually doing the customer success management for you or more likely, it's gonna be a mix of those things. And it's gonna be a mix of those things, or the mix, the mix of those things will be 
the ratio of those things will be based on the appropriate experience for the customer. So if you said, how many customer success managers do I need for my company? I would say that doesn't make any sense. That's not the right question. Because I don't know what the appropriate experience is for your different customer segments. So we have to understand what our customer segments need in terms of that appropriate experience so that I can give them just what they need. And then I can figure out, well, okay, this is what they need. I can figure out the technology and the people and the processes and everything that I need to put into place to make it work. So customer success management, that's the, that's the definition. And just to kind of, just so we're on the same page you know, about what customer success management includes, number one is the logical segmentation of your customers. Somebody asked me on, on Twitter the other day, what's the biggest mistake you see in customer success management? And that's a hard question to answer because I see a lot of stuff, man. I've seen things. But probably the number one thing is not segmenting your customers correctly because everything is predicated on that. So if you are not segmenting your customers correctly, how can you figure out what the actual uh, coverage levels you need in terms of humans? H how can you know what technology you need to put in place? That's the biggest problem. And a lot of people just subscribe to the sort of old school account management way of, of segmenting customers, which is again, based on how much they pay us. And that doesn't really work. It worked in account management because account management was just basically looking at our customers as accounts, as a number. I could take eight people and divide the customers up into this book of business and those, those account managers could sit there and call the customer or send an email, make sure they're gonna renew, make sure they know about the latest upgrade, and that's it. Customer success management actually means we have to work our customer through this process of becoming successful. So it doesn't work the same way. You can't just carry over this concept from account management, rename it to customer success and expect it to work. So logical segmentation is, is, is there. Orchestration, orchestration, you talk about experience. Orchestration is one of the, the easiest things we can do to make the experience for our customer not just more appropriate, but actually more effective. Orchestration is simply teeing things up, letting them know what's gonna happen. Managing expectations. What's 30, 60, 90 days look like with, with us when you become a customer? Hey, when, when you hit this success milestone, we'll talk about this, up, this upgrade that, you, that you'll need to go to the next step. But you don't need it right now because you're not there. But, but when you get there, we'll talk about it. Now when you have that upsell conversation, it's not, it's not really a sales conversation. It's just sort of reiterating what you've already agreed to. Intervention, that's sort of any... Well, any intervention with the customer. Anytime you need to intervene, reach out, have a touch point with them to move them in the right direction, or if you see that they're kind of moving off the right path, you intervene to move them back on the right path. And again, whether that's a human being doing that, whether that's a, the system is sending messages, doesn't matter. Measurement, obviously we need to make sure that we're measuring the right things. Expansion and renewal, that's part of customer success management. I say the account management, you know, the old school way of looking at account management didn't work, and it didn't, and it doesn't. The functions of account management, renewal and upsell, are still very much, very important. And where they're more complex with our customers, you know, we have a bigger customer that just has to, we have to go through a more complex procedure to renew them, or a more complex procedure to add something to their account. Well, we might need to have dedicated account management staff to do that but that sits within customer success management. And as long as that's sanity checked by this overall operating philosophy of customer success, then your account management is never gonna go off the rails and try to shove product onto a customer when they don't need it. So, as part of customer success management, we have expansion and renewal. Communication, obviously communication with the customers, but also communication internally. If you have a customer success management team, you know so much about the customer, but are you sharing it with the rest of the organization? You know how your customers are doing. You know how they're talking about your product. You know how they're talking about what they do. Are you sharing that with sales? Are you sharing that with marketing? I guarantee you, at least in the early days of a customer success management part of the organization, sales and marketing are not coming to you and asking for those things. So if you're not actively sharing that stuff, it's not being shared. So make sure that you do that. 
Uh, instrumentation and operationalization, those are just you know, making sure that we're able to get the telemetry uh, from, from, the, from the product, the product usage data if we have it. Um, but note that that's just one piece of this. You can do so much without, without really any technology. It's more of a mindset, more of just putting these things into, into place. So that's kind of what customer success management includes. And just to reiterate what I already said, but I really want to hit this home. Customer segments are determined by that appropriate experience. If you take nothing else away from what I've said today, please understand that. Customer segments are determined by the appropriate experience. Now, I happen to think appropriate experience can actually be your disruptive differentiator in the market. This could be the, the thing that makes you stand out, even if your product has functional parity with every other product on the market. They all, they all share the same basic functionality. If you can come in and give your customers an appropriate experience, or if you can unlock sort of a latent appropriate experience that's there that you know about, but your customers may not even know that that's what would be ideal for them, you could really do something great. And what do I mean by that? Think about these companies that unlocked, like for Amazon, I know it's not, it's not, there's some, I don't think Amazon's really big here, right? I only, deal, only sell books in Brazil, right? Right, not yet. In the US, it's changed everything. It's literally changed everything. They just bought a huge grocery chain. So it's, get, it's getting ready to really change everything. My appropriate experience for buying just about anything online now is in some way dictated by what Amazon does. But that's not because Amazon is telling us this is how you need to buy. They actually really started to understand the customers better than the customers even knew themselves. Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs at Apple is one of these guys that people say, oh my gosh, you know, he, he, could, he didn't actually ever talk to the customers, so he just kind of made this stuff up and said, here's what you need, and you take it, and you, you know. The reality is he actually understood the customers better than the customers even understood themselves. And there was this latent sort of just this appropriate experience that was just sitting there, and he came in and unlocked it. Tesla, Airbnb, Airbnb is a great example of this, right? All these, these people staying in hotels, and there's a subset of those who were very, very much like, this is not the appropriate experience for me anymore. And Airbnb came in and said, you know what? We think, that they're, we think you're right, and we're gonna start a business, start a little business around this. For those that were right there, for their, whom the AX of hotels was, was not appropriate, they jumped on Airbnb. And then they started to evangelize it. And then those for whom the AX was, was still latent, was still just under the surface, those people were evangelizing it, saying, I just, you know, I stayed in a really cool place. Now they kind of unlock that and you get concentric circles. And this is how companies like Airbnb and Uber and all these other companies really start to explode because there is this appropriate experience that's out there. Nobody's tapped into it yet. Nobody's really taken advantage of it. Salesforce did the same thing with software. They were the, really the first the first successful SaaS company, changed the way we buy and use software. Tesla's changing the way we buy and, well, they're changing what a car is and certainly changing the way you buy a car. So getting back to what we were talking about, appropriate experience is the key to defining your CSM, your customer success management operations. Remember, if you don't have the, if you don't have your segments properly defined, you can't, you can't figure out how, you know, what coverage you need. You don't know what kind of humans or technology you need. AX is also the key to scaling customer success management operations. Again, if I give all of my customers the same experience, I normalize that experience across all my customers, we're gonna run into scalability issues very, very quickly. I, a lot of companies I, I, I work with, you know, a year or two into having a customer success management operation, they're like, we, we just can't keep throwing, as they say, throwing bodies at this. And you're like, yeah, you can't. That's a really stupid way to go. You have to think about this. You have to apply the same logic that you apply to other parts of your business and stop just going after this in, in that account management way. Uh, appropriate experience is the key to profitable customer success management operations. If you normalize the experience across all your customers and treat everybody the same, even if it works out okay, I guarantee you some of the customer segments for whom you could give less you could you know, give them a lesser 
a lesser experience, but that experience will still be appropriate, you know, more self-service deflection, things like that. I guarantee you there are some customer segments right now in your business that are less profitable than they, than they could be because you're giving them way more than they need. But you don't understand that. You think they pay us a lot of money, so they deserve, they deserve or they need, you know, a human being on the phone with them every week. Do they? That's an assumption. You're just making an assumption because they pay you a lot that that's what you should be doing. You need to find out, is that actually what we should be doing? Over-delivering is the biggest threat to scaling customer success management operations and ultimately, the biggest threat to scaling your business. A lot of us say, hey, you know, we, let's over-deliver. You know, it's, like it's, some, it's a really positive thing. I get the sentiment. I understand that. You know, we want to over-deliver. But you actually don't want to over-deliver. You just want to deliver. Just deliver what is the appropriate experience for your customers. That's all. And that's all your customers want. And, and the thing is, most companies that say, let's over-deliver, they end up over-delivering on things that don't matter. And so they're, it's not like they're even giving them like a greater version of the appropriate experience. They're giving them an inappropriate experience and they're giving them too much of it. So be careful. So we go back to this. We want our customers to stay longer, buy more, and, adv okay. and advocate for us. These three things. Well, first of all, if we want those three things, we need to stop acquiring bad fit customers. Stop trying to shove square customers into a round hole of customer, customer hole. That doesn't work. Anyway, stop acquiring bad fit customers. Acquire customers with success potential. Some people, when I say this, when I say stop acquiring bad fit customers, only acquire customers with success potential, they will, they will say, are you telling me to say no to a potential customer? To not sign a customer? Who do you think you are? And I say, well, I know who I am. I'm comfortable with myself. And yes, I'm saying say no to some customers. Say good no's so you can say great yeses. One of the probably, you know, aside, I've already said this several times, but one of the biggest problems I see in customer success isn't actually a customer success issue. So some of the things that I've already said that were the big problems in customer success management are big problems in customer success management. One of the biggest problems I see overall is companies acquiring customers that do not have success potential. What that means is that they, they cannot get value from you. And then the customer success management organization trying to make those customers successful. Spending time, money, resources, trying to make customers who do not have success potential successful. That's probably not gonna work out well for anybody. So don't do that. But again, the, 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 the problem that I see or that I, I hear from people is, oh my gosh, you're telling me to say no. Well, I am, but what I'm telling you is not to think in terms of limiting your growth or anything like that. I'm saying just focus. Success potential is about focusing on the right customers. It's about focusing on customers that can stay longer, buy more, and advocate for us. So think about this. If we focus on customer success, we have our total addressable market, just all the customers that we could possibly have. Right now, in the orange, that's our total addressable market that has success potential. Our overall total addressable market, maybe they don't have success potential yet because we're not there. We don't have features or functionality or the ability to provide an appropriate experience, et cetera. But that's still our total addressable market and we'll get there. But right now, in the orange, if we focus on success potential, we grow that orange, we move into the blue, and we're good. Maybe 18 months later, you know, now we're really starting to grow we're, we're, making, we're making the necessary changes to expand the total addressable market that we have right now that's based on success potential. Great. If we don't focus on customer success, don't focus on success potential, there's, there's our same total, total addressable market. But we have, well now we're churning and burning some of our customers. We're bringing them in, they're not getting value, and they're leaving. 
That means our total addressable market, the blue and the orange, is now smaller than it was. So, you know, if you're churning and burning customers, that overall, what, you know, what you're pitching to investors or what you're pitching to whoever will listen to you about all the potential customers you have out there, it's not. You have to take into consideration those that have churned and burned. You also have to take into consideration some unquantifiable number of those that will not do business with you because those that churned and burned went and said bad things about you in the market. We get to a point where you've churned and burned a lot of customers because you're not focusing and now your old overall total addressable market is smaller. So what is success potential? If we're talking about focusing on it, then let's talk about what it is. It's these six things that if you cannot check the boxes on these six things, then we would say a customer does not have success potential. This is based on right now. In six months, it may be different. But let's start with technical fit. Technical fit is if you are built on top of Salesforce, if you've built a product on top of Salesforce, and, you, and your customer, your prospect doesn't use Salesforce, they don't have technical fit, you probably shouldn't sign them. Right, that's a pretty, those are pretty obvious ones. If you have built software for a Mac, don't sell it to somebody that runs Windows, right? Just simple things like that. But you would be surprised, or maybe you wouldn't, how often that's ignored. Functional fit. Are you missing some key features that at least for a particular segment of customers, that if without that, they're not gonna get value? Then they don't have success potential. That's an example of one that could probably change relatively soon, right? A couple months. So this is not a set it and forget it kind of thing. Resource fit. If your customers say to you during the sales cycle that they can't invest anything beyond what they're gonna pay you, so they, pay, they can pay your fee, but they can't actually do anything that else that's necessary to be successful, that's a problem. So if they can't invest the time, energy, resources, or money into being successful, that's gonna be a problem. Competence fit. Do they have the expertise or are they willing to acquire the expertise internally to be successful? If not, that's a problem. Experience fit. Can you provide the appropriate experience? If you cannot, they're a bad fit. And cultural fit. These are, these are a little bit softer, but in the US right now, we have, we have some interesting things going on. Uh, we have a lot of people that hate a lot of other people and we have technology companies that have been pulling down customer accounts who have been putting up hate speech. Now in the US, that speech is protected by law, but the, but it's, the company has the right to take down an account for whatever reason. So they're taking down accounts that, that don't, don't match up with what they want. That's a cultural fit. That's a decision that those companies have made to take down that hate speech, even though it could result in lawsuits and a lot of backlash. Cultural fit. If you can't check those boxes, they're not a good fit customer. So if I go through here and I cannot check that one box, even though it's one box, I shouldn't sign that customer because they can't get everything that they need out of us right now. This is what success potential is, all of those. Thing is though, it's not success guaranteed. If it was success guaranteed, just acquire good fit customers and we're good to go. But the problem is we have to actually unlock that potential, right? So which means we need to understand that some customers are ready to go and some customers are a little bit further away from being ready to go. We need to meet our customers where they are and bring them where they need to go. I call that the spectrum of readiness. So I'm gonna leave you with this definition of customer success because I think, again, this is the most important thing Understanding what customer success is, understanding that this should be your operating philosophy, and understanding that customer experience, everything else you hear today, everything else you hear today, if it is not predicated on delivering success to the customer, you might want to take it with a grain of salt. Because customer experience that doesn't lead to success is pointless. So customer success is when our customers achieve their desired outcome through their interactions with our company. Cool? Tabom? Tabom. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. Have a great day. Thank you, Lincoln.